Hi, I would like to talk about social aspects of machine learning, how to make pervasive machines fair and beneficial. Now, let's start with saying what is machine learning? Yeah. One would think about to say that machine learning is similar to science. Why? Because first of all, you have the same problems. You have to decide what data to collect and how. Okay. Most importantly, in both cases we will start with some hypothesis, an initial model of the world, and we would like to refine it using data, or completely refute it if it's possible. Finally, after we have gotten our data, we learn something about the world, but we still don't know everything. We still have things to discover. Okay. But we nevertheless have to make decisions anyway. We cannot just stop until we have learned everything and then make a decision. So this goes from simple things like a Roomba that is trying to clean your floor, it doesn't know exactly how your house is like, but it has to learn about it, to something more complicated like, for example, how to mitigate climate change. So all these are decision problems that involve learning. There is uncertainty, there is sequential decision making, and there is life, all at the same time. There is one problem in machine learning that actually incorporates all of those things. It's called the reinforcement learning problem. And it is the problem of learning how to act in an unknown world by interaction and reinforcement. For an example, let's take a look at the rat in the maze. This rat is actually taking actions in the maze, like moving left and right. It's called the actions AT. And by doing so, it also observes something like the wall, corridor, piece of cheese, let's call this XT. And the rat also has some goal in, in, in the world. It has a the goal of obtaining as much reward as possible. So it's the reward is just a number, and it has a value of zero when it has no cheese, and one when it has cheese. In that case, what you could say the rat is wanting is to eat as much cheese as possible. So let's say that we define a utility function U that tells us how much cheese the rat is eating. We need two variables. We need something about the world, something that tells us what the world is like. Let's call this theta. It's a layout of the maze and how often the cheese is placed in different places. And we call this pi, which tells us how the rat behaves. So for a given maze layout, theta, and a given rat behavior, pi, or policy, have a different utility. So there is, for every possible layout, there is a maximizing policy, the best policy, that gives you the most cheese. Can we just find this maximized policy? Yes, we can, but we have to know theta. But the problem definition says that theta is unknown, so we don't really know how the maze looks like. We just have a belief that is a possible maze, for example, or something else. So how should we actually act in that case? Well, one way to deal with this is to say that there are many, many possible models of the world. Let's say in this example two. And we assign a probability to each one of them. Let's call this the prior belief, beta zero. Assigning a number probability to every possible theta, every possible maze, uh, maze layout. Now, we can act in the maze and obtain a sequence of actions, observations, and rewards, which we can call the evidence, DT, until time t. Now, the interesting thing is that each one of these models assigns a different probability to the same evidence. So for the same policy and the same evidence, different theta assigns a different value of probability. And that means that we can now use this probability to update our belief. Okay? We can always do this because these are internal models of the world that we have, and we can always create models that assign such a probability to our evidence. We just need to multiply the prior probability of the world with the evidence probability, and we get a posterior. Okay, essentially. Now, in this particular case, the second world says there is no probability of this evidence actually happening. Yeah. It's impossible to go through the middle of the maze here, because there is no shortcut here. So it assigns a zero probability to this evidence, meaning that the posterior probability of this maze is also zero. We can extend this to more general cases arbitrary models, arbitrary priors. It's just a computational problem, essentially. Now, this hasn't solved everything. This is just about learning the model of the world. 
there is also the aspect of acting in the world. And one way you can deal with this is to be Bayesian again. You say, I would like the policy to be based in the sense that it's the best on average. So you basically multiply the utility of the policy for a specific world by the probability of this world. And you average over all of them. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is that now your policies have to anticipate future information. You can only maximize this in a nice way if you use adaptive policies or learning policies. Okay. So this means that now the problem is slightly more difficult or much more difficult than before. But theoretically, the problem is solved. Okay. So we have seen another unit of now is this. We have the modeling problem, the decision problem, and both problems appear in science. Um, let's take climatology, for example. We have different climate models. Each one of them is a very complicated simulator. You don't know which one is correct. You have measurements from sea boys, from thermometers, from satellite measurements. And you have to use all of them to find, let's say, what's the right model. And in cosmology, you might have a different case. You might not have a detailed simulator, but you might want to have a very general type of machine learning model, like a Gaussian process model. And you could use that, for example, to be able to guess uh, where dark matter is in the galaxy. You could use a graphical model to estimate connections between people, friendships, and so on. You can do lots of things. A decision problem always that appears in science is adaptive experiment design, or experiment design, simply put. So this is the problem of, given what you know already about the world, what kind of experiment you should design to learn the most, let's say, in the next year or so. So let's say if you're talking about the Hadron Collider, what things should you collide? What things should you measure? Where should you point the telescope? Where should you point the satellites to study the climate? Um, we even work a little bit in this field, in nuclear physics, where, for example, we wanted to uh, design simulated experiments in order to tell us uh, the parameters for a KFT model. Um, these are things that are done. Now, there is a specific simple example that we can take. And let's say you would like to design a drug that cures a specific disease. You could have a team of scientists, or you could use a robot. How do you use a robot? Well, the robot has to have access to lots of drugs, or a way to synthesize lots of drugs, and has to have a way of testing the drugs. Okay. Now, let's say you have a simple test of whether a drug is going to be active or inactive against the disease. Now, some drugs will be more or less active, but the test is, let's say, quite fast, and it can be easily measured by the machine. The problem is that you have millions of possible candidates, so it's impossible to test all of them. You have to be intelligent. So the thing to do is to you build the model, uh, tells you how likely its drug is going to be to be active, and then you choose the most promising candidates, and then you screen them. And then you see which are active and which are not active. From the screening data, you can put this screening data back into your model, and then you have an updated belief about which are the most likely good drugs, and using this updated belief, you can then design a new experiment uh, which can give you more information about the better drugs. Yeah, this is basically adaptive experiment design, and it's, it's basically a type of reinforcement learning problem as well, called the Banach problem. Now, the problem with, uh, let's say, science is kind of standard. You have simple or complicated models that are very well studied, uh, very focused application area. Um, very focused experiment design, everything's fine there. Sometimes you might have methodological errors, but that's okay. Uh, they get corrected in the peer review process. Now, the problem is that now machine learning is applied in everyday life. What by people that don't necessarily know what they're doing. So, for example, if you open a web page, you see advertisements telling you things to buy. Okay? Fine. Then you talk to your home assistant and say, I would like to buy, let's say, this car. The car is very expensive, so you would like to get a loan. So then you can apply for a loan, but then the bank application uh, for a loan will be processed maybe by a computer, and this will decide whether or not you get the loan. And then let's say you get the loan and you buy a Tesla or some other autonomous vehicle. And this is fine, but then when you are in the vehicle, essentially the, the vehicle decides what to do, not you. Okay. And then let's say you have a problem and you need to raise money. You might want to decide to drive for Uber. Fine, okay, so you drive for Uber uh, to make money, but 
So what you decides what to do essentially is the Uber application that decides where you should go and pick up passengers. Okay, you have strong incentives to follow what it tells you to do. And machine learning is also used in public policy. It's uh, used in judicial decisions. It's used in uh, medical insurance and medical decisions as well. It's also used in what is called predictive policing. Okay, so let's say for a moment that the people that design these things, they know what they're doing, even if they don't. And they design them to maximize what they really want to, what they care about primarily, which is mainly money. But uh, if you talk about public policy, maybe it's not. So let's say that they do that and their systems work. You still have some problems. You have the problems of price. So when you when you when you interact with a web page, uh, everything you do is essentially monitored, tracked by so-called beacons that connect your activity across websites. When you talk to your uh, home assistant, obviously you have privacy problems. Fairness is a very big issue. Uh, you think, for example, of the of Amazon who tried to build a CV screening system, only to find out that it was always rejecting female applicants for job interviews. And safety, more generally, is very important, especially when you think about uh, systems that are uh, physical, like cars. But it's also important when you are thinking about systems that are deployed at large scale, because then they can have a large scale effect, and this effect essentially creates a large scale risks. Now, now research in this field uh, in sequential decision making focuses mainly on regret bounds and privacy. That's the theory part of reinforcement learning. We also worked a bit on, on algorithms for efficient reinforcement learning. We worked quite a bit also on approximate Bayesian computation for, for reinforcement learning. And finally, uh, we worked on inverse reinforcement learning, which is the problem of basically trying to see why the rat is doing what it's doing. You can apply this also to human analysis of behavior. And there are many applications of, of reinforcement learning, let's say commercial applications, like say for recommendation systems. And, but also in science, there are experiment design applications and have used uh, reinforcement learning in nuclear physics and drug design. And we're also looking right now at applications in autonomous vehicles, specifically focusing on safety with respect to the behavior of other drivers on the road. But what I would like to focus today is fairness aspects and privacy. So what is fairness? Well, there are many main definitions of fairness, but we would like to focus here on non-discrimination. So you would like not discriminate against protected groups, let's say on the basis of gender or, or race or ethnicity or something like that. You can also think about proportionality, in terms of representation or meritocracy. So you'd like, for example, to hire the best people. And our work on this field focused mainly on, on Bayesian fairness or a, a concept of fairness under passion information. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about this today. So um, I will talk about the general idea uh, of, of what is a specific problem in fairness. Let's say that somebody in America is accused of a crime. And in that case, they will appear before a judge to what is called the bail hearing. So the judge sees this person's futures X. And there are also some sensitive features, the race or gender, things like that. Now the judge has a choice of action. They can put the person in jail until trial, or they can let them out of jail. And you can formalize the process by which the judge is making a decision by what we call a policy. In the same way that the right has a policy, the judge also has a policy. So this gives the probability of an action given the futures of the individual. Now, we want this not to depend directly on the sensitive futures, like the race. So we don't want to be, let's say, biased against white men, okay, for example. Um, so we'd like to be independent of that. So that's one way to say that we're not depending directly on these futures. So then what happens is that when somebody goes to jail, they will have to go to trial for sure. And they might also go to trial if they don't go to jail, but it's also possible that they will uh, commit another crime while out of jail, or they will escape. Yeah. Now, you can assume there is some kind of model, some parameter theta, that tells us the distribution of these things. That's fine. And you can assume also that the judge has some utility function that describes what they want. So in this particular case, she might prefer people that don't go to jail and then go to trial, and she doesn't like it when people commit another crime, and she really doesn't like it when people go to jail if they're innocent. Okay. 
So if we have formalized this problem like this, then in theory we could just create an algorithm that does the same thing as the judge. And in fact, there was a study that was done in 2016 that shows that you could, retrospectively, you could perhaps have done better decisions uh, if you replace the judge by an algorithm. Now, the problem is that this is a retrospective study, so we don't really know if replacing a judge by an algorithm could actually be better. But we do have another system that is not actually taking decisions, but it is giving risk scores. So a defendant appears before a judge, let's call this defendant XT. And the judge normally makes a decision, but in here we have a system, an AI system, that assigns a risk score. This is not a direct decision, but it's like a score. But you can think about it like a decision if you like. So in this case, there was an apparent bias. So if you were black, you were much more likely to get a higher score than if you were white. And they said, people said, well, this may be bias. But then the company that uh, actually designed the system said, well, wait a bit. Here is the risk score, and here is the probability that somebody commits a crime. So this is the Y, the result, and the score is A here. And we see that when we increase the score, then both black and white people get the same probability of committing another crime. So instead of, in terms of probabilities, you can say that uh, Y, the result, is conditionally independent of the race Z, given the score A. That's fine. So everything's fine? No, no, no. Uh, then the ProPublica people went back to the data again and said, wait a bit. Uh, if you look at the people that did not reoffend, you see that the white people had much more likely to have a lower score than the black people, which had equal amount of low and high scores. While if you look at the reoffending people, the black reoffenders had always high scores pretty much, while the white reoffenders had equal low and high scores. So how does this work? What does this mean? It means that another independence condition is not satisfied, and it's the condition that A, the score of the system, is not conditionally independent of the race Z given the result Y. If it was, then where, when you're going to know the result, then your score should not anymore depend on the race. But in this case, it is. So is it possible to reconcile these things? No. In fact, for both of these things to hold, to, to hold you need to have the, the race variable be a completely independent random variable of everything else. So it's not really possible. Uh, unless it's just some random thing that doesn't depend on anything. Okay. So that's fine. Um, in general, this is a problem with fairness. We can't do anything about it. But on the other hand, this is why it's an interesting area of research because uh, people are interested in finding measures for uh, creating fair decision rules, even though we know that perfect fairness is never possible, even though we know that many different fairness conditions are actually contradictory. We still would like to create a system where fairness is somehow guaranteed in at least uh, some of these possible aspects. And we'd like at least to measure how fair this thing is, okay? even if we cannot achieve perfect fairness in all possible ways. Now let's look to the next subject, it's privacy. It's also important. Let's say that I have a disease and I would like to participate in a medical study because maybe there's a cure that's coming up from this study. Yeah. So I give my data to the database, X. And let's say a judge comes up. And she also has a disease and she would like to contribute her data to the database. That's fine. Now let's say the study is done and they use some algorithm pie to release something about the data. It can be some general statistics or it could be actually some anonymized version of the data we gave. The problem is that if somebody could invert this computation, they could perhaps get our data back. Okay. Just knowing if I'm in the database is actually an important piece of information because if I'm in the database, it's very likely that I have the disease, okay? So, can somebody actually get something from the anonymized data? Well, let's look at this example. Uh, the governor of Massachusetts, Bill Weld, decided in the 90s that people in the state that were state workers should have their health records released publicly for research purposes. Now, people complained about this as a breach of privacy, but actually um, he said that's fine because we have removed the names, so there's no problem. 
Now, let's take a look at this. Now you have another data set, which is actually the voter registration data of the same state, which you could get for $20 on a floppy disk. And Maxwini did that uh, when she was working at the time uh, at the university. And she could then combine these two data sets, and from these two data sets, she could actually obtain the health records of the governor, Bill Weld. And she later showed that you could actually identify 87% of Americans just on the basis of these three attributes here. Now, there is one way to solve this problem, and it is by having an algorithm that releases data in a differentially private way. What does this mean? An algorithm is differentially private if an output distribution of the algorithm doesn't change very much when you change the data only a little bit. Let's be a bit more precise. Let's say that in one database, I have contributed my data together with two other people. And in another database, my data is unfair. If the algorithm for generating the output is differentially private, then the probability of a specific output is almost the same under the two databases. So this means that if somebody observes an output, they cannot tell whether the output came from this database or that one. So that means that they cannot even tell whether or not I was part of the database. So this is a very strong privacy guarantee because if they cannot even tell whether I was in the database, they have no way of telling what my data was. Okay. This is a very nice privacy concept, it has very many applications, and we have also done quite a bit of work on it, a lot of it on the Bayesian setting, and we have also worked on uh, applications in, in personal learning, as well as applications in the smart grid where you would like, let's say, for example, to uh, share your, your consumption information. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is safety. So in safety, uh, we have many different problems in safety, but one of the most interesting things for me is what happens when humans and AI interact. So we would like the AI to help the human do stuff. Okay. One of the problems that arises is that the humans and the AI generally don't agree on reality, either because they have different models of the world or they just because they see different things or they see the world in a different way. And we don't, don't just want the system, we don't just care about systems where you have just recommendations. Let's say in this compass system, there's a recommendation or a, a risk score by the system, but the judge can ignore it if they like. Okay. Uh, we care about systems where there's an active control by both the AI and the human. And this active control creates problems. So we can formalize this in, in what we call a multi view decision process. Uh, in this setting, you have basically a common utility for both agents. This means that both the human and the AI want the same thing, okay? However, the human model is different from the AI model. This means that it's actually impossible to do the optimal thing, because if I think one thing and you think another, then you maybe think I should turn left and I think you should turn right. Yeah. Uh, in a particular case of, of aircraft, uh, if the aircraft is not uh, let's say flying uh, uh, on a stable uh, f uh, straight trajectory, then the human might think that they should push the nose down and the, and the AI might think they should push the nose up uh, or the other way around. And this is probably what happened in some of the recent uh, Boeing crashes. Okay? Sometimes it's the human that might be at fault. Okay? He doesn't know uh, what's going on. Or it, sometimes the AI can get fault, like a sensor might be malfunctioning. Or it could be both. Okay? But what is interesting is that we have found that if you design the AI so it takes into account what the human might believe, it can actually achieve slightly better outcomes or less catastrophic outcomes than if the AI assumes the human is, uh, is acting correctly or the other way around. So what we need is to design AIs in such a way that they take into account explicitly human behavior and human modeling of the world and also take into account what the human believes about what the AI believes in some sense. So, because sometimes the AI actually provides little information about what is doing to the human. So, one thing to think about as well is how should the AI communicate with the human so that they agree on what's the right model of the world. Yeah. And this is also very important. So, to conclude, um, machine learning techniques 
have found a very, very nice home on scientific applications where they can be used for many topics, let's say climate science, protein folding, uh, mapping dark matter in the galaxy, that's all fine. You can design experiments in a very nice, efficient way. But they are kind of misapplied when they are applied in the real world, in some sense, where they are applied in a large scale. Because then, even if you design the AI perfectly well for a narrow goal, a lot of times you have side effects, like bridges of price, an algorithm that appears unfair or is unfair to some groups. Uh, you might create safety concerns, even though your, your system might be working fine in isolation, when you put a large number, let's say, of Tesla cars on the road, maybe uh, when you have a few Tesla cars on the road, it's, let's say, one crash a million miles, but if you have a million Tesla cars on the road, maybe it becomes 10 uh, crashes in a million miles. Yeah? So you know, there might be things that change when you change the scale of the system. And the systems that have large scale also have larger effects on society, just because they exist. So when we design a system these days, because we know they cannot just, they're not just individually applied to individual people, they're applied to society, we have to make sure that uh, we address ethical concerns from the very beginning. And we have to take into account possible social considerations from the very beginning. And this means that people in science, in computer science, statistics, have to work closely with people from humanities, law, you know, social sciences, in order to be able to design systems that are beneficial for everybody and they don't have unintended side effects.